Hello everyone, welcome to a, another session of the Aussie Live Conference. Today we have Kathy Beck all the way from North Carolina in the United States sharing her wisdom um, in information communication technology. Her session is called Go Smell the Roses. Kathy is currently working as an instructional technology coordinator in um, across 36 schools in North Carolina. She has a, a Bachelor of Science in Primary Ed and Psychology and she also has a Master of Education, a Master of Arts, sorry, um, in Educational Media and Instructional Technology. Her passion is obviously around information communication technology and working with educators and students um, on collaborative projects where technology is integrated. Uh, hi Ben, welcome, nice to see you. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our number one supporter is the Learning Revolution Project and Steve Hargadon. He has been instrumental in providing us the space to um, present the conference to you, so thank you to Steve. We also like to thank Blackboard Collaborate for the room. Um, the Australia E-Series is the group of volunteers that have brought you the Aussie Live conference and we've been working tirelessly behind the scenes to, to have it up and running. Okay, so there's only a few of us in the room at the moment, but if you'd like to grab a little icon and move it to your part of the world and show us where you are. Whoops, I'm a little bit too far north. Lovely. North Carolina. Big smiley face. Excellent. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to um, to Kathy's presentation. So Kathy, take it away. Okay, thank you and welcome Ben. My name is Kathy Beck, as Ness said, and I look forward to sharing a lot of information this afternoon. Well, it's afternoon here uh, with everyone that participates or views this recording. I called this Go and Smell the Roses because I was intrigued by the Travelocity Gnomes TV commercials about getting off the couch and going out and exploring the world. And I think one of the things we have to challenge ourselves to do as educators is to make those global connections and help our students make those global connections as well. And of course, I work in the field of technology, so I'm always attempting to make those kinds of connections as well. So you'll see that theme throughout. And I also realized when I was reading this quote by Mark Twain about travel being fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, is I realized that a lot of students that we work with may never leave their own community. They may never travel outside that particular area or certainly to some of these other areas of the world. But because we have all these technology tools, we can now help students travel and make those global connections as well. So my goal today is to actually show you some information about global groups and projects, the Global Ed Conference, which I've participated in and presented for, the Global Read Aloud. I'm going to give you lots of global websites, a look, little look at a flat project. Um, a little information about Google Lit Trips and lots of tools and apps. And this is going to be a lot of information and go very quickly, but I'm going to give you a link to where you can find all of this information on my website and you can actually then browse and pick and choose what you'd like to explore or learn about. So I don't want you to panic that you have not written everything down. So what we want to do is get those students to have real world opportunities for real world learning and can they get out there and smell the roses through the use of technology. So let's do a poll and Ben if you'd like to use your poll tool above the names in the group, you can let me know where you're working from or what your role is or you can type that in the chat. I currently work with seven different schools in a county of 36 schools. They are elementary, middle, and high, and we are a multi-platform school district, so um, 
I have to find activities when I'm working with teachers for MacBooks, for Windows-based tools, and for iPads. And that's essentially why I have an extreme amount of content, because I'm always looking for those particular things that meet the needs of the school where I'm working and the teachers where I am working. OK, great. So this is the only website that you will really need today. If you can capture this one, you will be able to navigate to everything that you need and everything that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to capture, put that in the chat right now. And so this website has all the links to all the places I'm kind of going to fly through. So again, if you have this site, you can actually navigate to these. Um, at a later date and pick and choose what you're interested in and what you need. So I'm going to start by sharing some groups that you can join with to make those global connections. And what I find when I work with teachers is that they're intimidated by starting any kind of global project because they don't know where to start. And so I've gathered these groups together on that website because I feel they've already done the groundwork for you. And they've made the resources, and they've made the connections. And all you have to do is find the group that you're interested in working with and use their resources and their connections to make those global connections for your classroom. So there's a lot here, but again, they're all linked on that website. The first one actually comes out of North Carolina, where I live out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and it is Worldview. And Worldview has nice resources for educators to make those global connections. It has professional development. It has online courses. And it also is working on a global competency scale and sort of a rubric that educators can use to help develop their global competency and global skills. The second site that I'm going to focus on is the Asia Society. This is a very large organization that is attempting to promote understanding and strengthening partnerships between Asia and the United States. But certainly, no matter where you are in the world, you could make connections through this Asia Society. They have a Partnership for Global Learning, which has um, leadership activities and K-12 strategies for approaching those kinds of activities. And they even have webinars for educators to make those global learning skills a little bit easier to manage within the classroom. One of my favorites is Taking It Global because they are looking at not just communication, but working on global issues to make a positive change. Lots of resources within their site for teachers to use and make those global connections. And they've just recently added an app to um, help users that are working from an iPad. One of their subgroups is Global Encounters, which actually has students participating in live video conferences to explore global issues. And when you participate in one of these, it is really profound to see the conversations that are occurring live between these students. It's a wonderful new group to get involved in with international students. Because what do we want? Well, we want them to connect. And we want them to learn how to collaborate. And I work a lot with um, uh, different different facets in the business world. And one of the things they talk about is that the students that were graduating are not skilled at collaboration. So the global connection is really important, but so is the collaboration skill. So I would encourage you, if you've never participated in the Global Ed Conference, it happens in the fall. And Steve is a, as part of that as well that Ness mentioned. And this is the most fabulous several-day conference. Now, all their sessions are recorded for viewing later. But you will find the sessions are so fabulous. If you're like me, I wanted to be up 24 hours just to, just to participate in every one. And they had multiple sessions going at the same time. So you know, you'd be watching one and waiting to get back and record another. But the content is fabulous there. You have national speakers. You have authors. You have educators. And even so far as this past year, students. 
And so one, I was really impressed with this presentation by Dylan DeWart, who was a high, is a high school senior. And he created the Global Buddy Organization because he decided that schools needed uh, help in developing cultural understanding and global friendships around the world. So here's a high school student who's actually working on creating global content. You could hear someone like Homa Tavangar who wrote Glowing, Growing Up Global and co-authored the Global Education Toolkit. Just fabulous, fabulous speakers and it is really wonderful, lots of information that you can take away from that and those recordings. And you could go back and watch the sessions from 2014 right now when you go to their website, which is also linked on my website so that you can get to all these. You might want to explore something called the Kid World Citizen Organization, which has a database of age appropriate and fun activities that they've gathered from around the world on different topics and celebrations and holidays and festivals and music and literature surrounding multiple cultures, which is really great. Again, giving you those resources that you can use to make those connections or to share that information with your students. And that's what we want. We want them to make those kinds of connections, those global connections. Another group is the Global Nomads Group. This is an international organization that wants to foster dialogue and understanding among the youth. And it is, again, a, an organization that has lots of information and lots of projects for you to collaborate and make those global connections to global issues for your students. One of my favorites, of course, is I earn the international, um, an international group. It has 140 countries, 30 languages, 50,000 educators, and millions of youth working together to make those global connections. It has online projects, professional development, special events, and they just recently added a collaboration center where they're joining interactive curriculum-based groups in which students are creating and researching and sharing opinions and becoming global citizens. So this is a great group if you really want to reach out on a larger, larger uh, panel. One of their subgroups is Kids Can Make a Difference, and it is a group that's working towards um, projects to enhance learning and make a difference in the world for, for kids. Well. You know, just a pause here, of course, we want to make sure that we have students graduating from our schools that are globally competent, that are lifelong learners, that are engaged in issues outside their territory, whether they ever leave there or not, because they need to have an ability to learn and discover and engage in those global issues. So here's another great group, the Global School Networks Mission. And their focus is a little different in that they're working towards brain-friendly learning and academic performance. But again, they have programs and collaboration activities and content that you can use to make those global connections. Uh, out of Yale University is the peer group, Programs in International Education Resources, and they have extensive resources to develop and implement programs and services and resources to advance the um, understanding of international and world regional issues. Again, all of these are linked on that website so that you can explore these. And I, I like peer because it breaks their studies down into different cultural groups. But you need to find, of course, the group that works for you or the groups that work for your particular area and your expertise. Uh, globallearningeducation.com is a great group using uh, communication technologies to help diverse cultures communicate. And I like Global Dimension for a really quick site to pick up resources because they've organized them so nicely for us teachers who have very little time by subject, by age range, by topic, and by whole school. So that's a great one to just get to quickly and get some resources for your classroom. 
Maybe your students are not ready to participate in a global activity or make those connections. You could join something called Odyssey Angels, which is a group that helps you overcome a problem or issue right in your own area. And they partner with you to help you uh, create a project that solves that issue or problem in your own area. And it might be a starting point for your students to just get m more stewardship minded. I'm not going to actually try and get you to take, get to this video, but if you have never seen Ms. Adichie speak, you must get this link, um, and I will put that in the chat as well. You need to get this link to her video from TED Talks about the danger of the single story because she is a profound speaker, and she talks in depth about being an early reader and writer growing up in Nigeria where life was very different from what she read because the books were all based on British life. And then she started to write about life in her own world, and she came to America and she was surprised at the single story that people had about her coming from Nigeria, that she should be listening to tribal music. and. Um, how does she speak English when she grew up in Nigeria, even though that's their um, native language? And she talks about if you show people is one thing over and over, that is what they become in our minds. And it's not that the single story is not true, it's that it's incomplete. And so it caused me to think about how many times we have created this single story in our mind of what a particular culture or people are like. And I can relate it to this image. And so if you've ever seen this old movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, a, an open airplane drops out a Coca-Cola bottle into an African country. And we see in the movie these scantily clad natives who are trying to figure out what is this Coca-Cola bottle and what can we do with it and how it affects their lives. And they speak in clicks and sounds and not language. And I think, is that the single story we have of the continent of Africa? It's possible if we've not exposed our students to these other cultures that that's the single story they have. Or maybe they have the Hollywood version of Africa where Robert Redford um, is you know flying around in his airplane and being extremely romantic in this beautiful land of Africa. And so I think we need to be aware that we can keep students from having that impression of a single story by exposing them to these different cultures and activities through the use of technology. So that's what I challenge you to consider. Here's another source that you might want to look at called Primary Source World, where there are resources for globalizing, and they are designed around primary sources, such as documents and so on, that you can use within your language arts field. <clears throat> so I talk to teachers a lot about using some easy ways to go global in your classroom, such as Skype and ePals blogs and wikis and Twitter and Google. So we'll look at some of those. But my favorite for this past year was the Global Read Aloud program. And the Global Read Aloud program occurs in the fall. And the group selects a series of, of books for students to choose from and read. So as a classroom teacher, you, you and your students pick a book. And you read that during that period of the project simultaneously and aloud with all of these other folks. So all over the world, people are reading, students are reading this book. And so if that's not a profound connection, first of all, it's just amazing to see how many people participated in the Global Read Aloud. So I was working with the middle school group. And I, I can't really picture reading aloud with middle school students. Or I couldn't, but I can now. And we were reading one for the Murphys. And so in one for the Murphys, we were reading each week. We read a certain number of pages. And I was so surprised the first time we were reading aloud. And, and we got to the end of where we were going to read that day. And they all groaned, like, no, keep reading. Don't stop. And I thought, wow, this is, you don't think about reading aloud to middle school and high school students. But it really was very effective. But here's the profound thing. So the way the Global Read Aloud is set up 
is that the connections are made in Edmodo. And so Edmodo is a safe learning management system. So within Edmodo, you can make connections with every single group that's reading those books like you see here on this map. So even if you haven't joined any of those organizations that I showed at the beginning, here's a way that you could make connections with hundreds of classrooms around the world that you could then use in your future projects for global connections. And you're making a connection with them through that very safe feature of Edmodo, which if you've not used that, is very, very easy and user friendly. And of course, Edmodo is a web tool and an app for iPads, so you can use that regardless of what kind of tool that you're functioning from. All right, so moving along, I often hear from my arts folks, the enhancement groups or the people who teach art, music, and so on, that there are no technology tools available for them to integrate into their classroom because they're just too different. And so I search for groups for them particularly, such as Creative Connections, where they can make connections with other students around the world through the arts. And so it's not so math, language, arts, science oriented. It's more oriented for the arts. All right, let's talk about Skype. <clears throat> if, if you want to go the easiest route, take some of the connections that you've made and use Skype to communicate around the world. Skype even has something called Mystery Skype, where you can get kids guessing where the group is that they're communicating with. And there are all kinds of lessons there for teachers as well, so you don't have to create that. They have organization, organized so that you can find a teacher um, around the world and make those connections. And they recently added the literacy program where you can make connections with authors or illustrators. And this is really a profound thing for students to be able to see and talk to and ask questions to someone who wrote a book that they are profoundly impacted by. Again, Skype is a web tool and an app, so it works on all platforms. You could join something called the Global Classroom Project, which is working to help teachers collaborate and share and lead globally and it has a lot of resources and projects that you can get involved with. All right, back to the idea of blogs. Uh, there are lots of blogging sites, and your school may actually have a website that lets you access blogs, as ours does. But you could use kid blogs or blogger or edge blogs. And I work with teachers a lot to help them develop a rubric for those posts for students. But it really seems to engage them in writing much more than pencil and paper. And the fact that they can write about things in a, in a semi-anonymous mode, if that's how you set that up, so that they can discuss things that maybe they wouldn't raise their hand in the classroom to talk about. But the beauty of the blog is that you can have participants from around the world. And I've had students communicate with authors of books as well on a blog and are so impressed that that author would take the time to respond to their comments on that, on that blog. So there are great tools there that you can use. The wikis as well is another one that you can use to communicate. So how do we get students thinking about what's going on in the rest of the world? I like to share with teachers sometimes tools that are connected to the news to kind of spark that conversation for connecting globally. And so my favorite new tool is Newseum, because Newseum has partnered with over 800 newspapers worldwide. And what it does is it displays the front page of those newspapers each day on its website. Now, I always tell teachers to look at the website of the newspaper before they go there with students or do it on a projected image, because sometimes the content can be um, maybe not suitable for students. But how it works is they have partnered with all these newspapers. And so what you can do when you go to their site is you can choose the area of the world that you want to focus on. And you'll see on the map that, that, that it will actually then let you choose 
from any of these papers. So I chose North America right now because that's where I am. But when you click on those dots, you get to the newspapers from that area. So I always do activities with students that ask these kinds of questions. What's the newspaper look like in your town? What's on the front page? Now let's go and look at a newspaper in a bigger city or in another state or in another country. What are they focused on? What are the similarities? What are the differences? This website also features the top 10 front pages of the day. It's just really interesting to get their thought processes thinking about, hey, you know, what's on the front page of my newspaper might not be what's important to somebody else. And the day I did this with students, we had a community group that was battling some um, graffiti on one of the buildings in our town. And so the front page of the paper showed this Mickey Mouse that was painted on the side of a building. And this was the big issue in the town where I lived was, what are we going to do about this graffiti? And so then I had students look at the New York Times and the London Times. And isn't that interesting? There was no Mickey Mouse graffiti story on their newspapers. And I thought, doesn't this kind of push students to open their eyes towards things that are going on outside of their own community? There are also other web tools that are news-based, such as News ELA, where you can find articles by topic and grade level and reading standard. Or you can use an app called Newsy, which shows uh, short video bites of the news, which is nice for those students who just need that little charge of information in a video format. To continue, let's talk about ePals. ePals is a great community, again, a safe community for you to make connections for your students to have electronic pen pals across the world and make those connections in a safe community. If you're a Google uh, school district, which we have become, our middle and high school students now have their own email accounts through Google, and so they have access to Google Drive and Google Docs. Now they can communicate and collaborate on a document in their own classroom, in the building, across the district. But why not around the world? Why not make those connections and get a collaborative document, presentation, spreadsheet, and project going on in Google with those connections that you've made? And they recently added Google Story Builder, which lets you showcase that Google document story in a little video, which is kind of cute. So let's go on to some web tools. I, When I first came across web tools that were comics, I really didn't think students of all ages would buy into using them, but they do. And there are some really key features to the comic strip websites. and applications that force students to synthesize their information. So they can't just blah, blah, blah on about nothing. They only have so many squares of the comic, or they only have so much text they can add. So they really have to get to the key points. I have a math teacher who has students creating tutorials on how to solve problems in comic strips. And she can use those over and over, post them on her web page. Um, her favorite, of course, is Make Believe Comics, which is a great one to use. And it also has features in multiple languages. So if you're collaborating or posting that on your website to collaborate with global communities, you could do that. Create a Comic is an easy one to use on an iPad. You could use something like Toontastic, which uh, um, I understand has recently just become free, which is a great cartoon application as well as story kit which lets student write students write their own storybook and you find that their performance is enhanced and their product is enhanced when publishing occurs because all of a sudden it's not just something they turned into you it's something that's being promoted outside the classroom this one always surprises me. This is Zooburst. It is a web tool and an app. And it's a digital pop-up storybook. And I thought, pop-ups, I'm thinking really, really, really young children. Here's how it works. You can add your own images. You can then, 
on each page, the images pop up when you turn the page, and each image can connect to text. It can connect to images. It can connect to a link. The story has a text line at the very bottom, which can even be read aloud. So I'm still thinking elementary, elementary. You know, we're going to the beach. I took my beach ball. I packed my dog. We went from the house. We went here. But when you go to their website and look at the samples, you would be amazed at the higher level stories that are be being created in this pop-up book. What are the causes of World War II? the scientific explanation of what makes rain. And so you can really see that if you just give students an opportunity to pick a tool, that you'll be amazed to what they will do with it. And they're certainly much more creative than, than we will ever be. And when I showcase these to students, I don't tell them how to use it. I tell them this is what it can do, and I let them go. And I'm always standing behind them going, hey, how, how did you do that? So I learn from them as we go through it. And I tell teachers that, too. You don't have to know the ins and outs of all these tools. Present it to the students. Give them a couple of choices of different kinds of tools. Have a rubric for, for you to evaluate their product. But let them figure out the tool, and they do. So we can use a lot of online tools and apps that are collaborative. Poplet is a mind map or concept mapping tool that you can use collaboratively, again, in a global activity. Poplet lets you add images to your concept map, links, documents, text, video, and it, again, is a collaborative tool. We use, uh, we've often used these little sticky note apps as um, exit polls. You know, when a student leaves your classroom, he can post a sticky note, I need help with this, I need further instructions, I didn't understand this, that, or the other. But I see teachers now using this in a collaborative manner online where they have students creating a timeline of events that they're researching or a story in an order of time using those sticky notes. So there's lots of ways to get outside the box with some of these apps. Stories Unbound used to be a website. It is now just an app. I do find it to be really interesting because you can read and write and geotag stories to a location. And then it functions like a Google Earth, a Google Maps site where you can actually zoom down to the street level of, the, of that story where that occurs. So again, students can publish and read about other stories in other locations or their own. Why are we involved in all this anyway? Well, when Friedman wrote The World is Flat, he really made it clear that individuals can now make a substantial impact on the world and can have a global impact. And so because we can, we should be preparing students to do that. There are no guaranteed jobs now. Jobs will be outsourced to whoever's the most educated and most capable. And so students need to be prepared to connect globally to make those um, employment opportunities more viable for themselves. So when we talk about FLAT, of course, there is the FLAT project. And the FLAT project, if you're not familiar with it, is for students to create on a piece of paper a character typically known as FLAT's family, to put it in an envelope and to mail it to someone else who then takes that piece of paper with them throughout their day and writes about what that what that piece of paper got to see them do or takes photographs. It is now in, in a digital platform on the web and in an app. But I use it to kind of push teachers to start a global activity because all it requires is that piece of paper, a stamp, and an envelope. So I have a great one to share with you. And this is actually from a relative of mine. Little Lucy decided to create Flat Sally and send Sally to visit her Uncle Tim, who lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this is their story. So Sally arrives at Uncle Tim's house, and she expresses that it was kind of hard to breathe in that envelope. And so you can see there's no technology required here, a piece of paper, a character drawn and colored, and an envelope. So there she is, and she goes to Timmy's. And here's Tim, and he, he thinks her name is kind of odd and kind of questions what kind of name, you know, it's Flat Sally. And she says, well, you call me Flat Judith, and he just really does not get it. But you will see that Tim is quite involved in this story. 
as he takes Flat Sally to work with him. And Tim's a welder, and so she sits and watches him weld these really big trailers. And he says, as she sits and drinks coffee and eats donuts, that she'd sit right in here just watching him work. Then he shows her how to weld. She thinks this is really fun, but it's also a little dangerous. I just love how much effort he put into this. Then he takes Flat Sally snowboarding. And so there they are. They're going to um, go on some jumps and ride the chairlift. And she's also noticing she's sort of underdressed. But whatever, they're going to have mega air and they're going to be famous. And you know, how profound is this for a student to see, hey, look, this is what a snow snow experience might look like. Because Flat Sally is right there on the snowboard. And uh, do they get famous? Well, no, not so much. Flat Sally now has a broken arm and dislocated vertebrae. And Timmy is just fine. And then decides that she needs some appropriate clothing for their next snowboarding trip. And then back in the envelope, she goes back to Lucy, where Lucy finds out all about what that experience was like. And maybe that Tim went a little overboard, but how fabulous is that? So how you could do that with students that you're making connections with without a piece of technology can encourage other teachers to make those connections and try something like that out. All right. There's also Global Lit Trips. If you've not explored this, or Google, not Google, <laughs> Google did a great thing where they aligned a lot of literature to Google Earth. And what you will see when you access their site is that each piece of literature is connected to Google Earth. So if you're reading around the world in 80 days, you'll actually be able on Google Earth to see all the locations that that story took place. And just like in Google Earth, you can zoom around into those particular areas and really see what it's like. So it connects literature with the visual of the location, which is great because you don't have to create it. They did it for you. Or maybe you want to create that. Heganu is a website that will let you upload an image where you can add links to text and images of your own. And they have maps in place that are connected to something like World War II and the battles of World War II, or you can create your own. What I really like about this is it's simply a matter of uploading that image, adding those links and hotspots to that image. And what they give you as a result is a link to share out, an embed code, and a QR code so that you can put that on your website or your blog. Very easy to function within. OK, QR codes, while we're talking about those. You know, QR codes are everywhere. And if you're not using them as a classroom teacher, I challenge you to add that. I have teachers using those everywhere. We make QR codes that link to the teacher's website. We post them outside the door for parent night. So all they have to do is scan that QR code, and they can get to the teacher website where she's posting newsletters and homework and so on. This bulletin board here was outside of my media court, one of the media centers. And these were book reports by students. And so you could scan the QR code and literally hear the student give a book report out loud. My media coordinator that I work with also has genres around the library, which are QR codes. And the students can scan the QR code and see that information about that genre. Or it takes them to the author's website. In the science classroom, you can hang those on that skeleton that's just standing in the corner that links to you know, videos about that part of the body or that structure of the body. It's just great ways to use QR codes. And I think that uh, QR Voice is really fabulous because QR Voice lets you type in a short message. It creates that QR code for you. And it also will let that message be read aloud in multiple languages. And you can choose from all these languages. So that's really a great, great tool. And I was on a trip to Pennsylvania where my family lives. And I was encouraging my daughter, get closer, get closer. I want to see what this QR code is. And the back of this truck said this, if my contents were any more high tech, you'd have to be beamed aboard. 
and the QR code took me to the Snap-on Tools website. And I'm like, being a board, this is what I want in the classrooms that I work in. Wouldn't it be great if you could say, my classroom is if, if it were any more high tech, you'd have to be beamed aboard. And the tools that are free to create QR codes are fabulous now. They're so easy to use. You can even create QR codes that are images and are in different colors. And all of these can be picked up on that website that I'll give you again in a, in a moment. So there it is. Um, this is the website that I posted in here earlier. And when you're browsing, you can see all of the groups that you can connect with and their infographics and additional information. But there are two links there that take you to two more of my sites, one on apps and one on tools. And I'll put those in the chat here in just a second. My goal was to have two sites where teachers could go and pick tools or apps that were free. Now, because we are a multi-platform um, school district, I had to have web tools and apps for iPad as well. So this is the first site. And this is my Bloom's Digital Web Tools site. And I'll put this URL in the chat as well. And when you get to this site, you can get to that from the Globalizing Gen Z site so that you don't have to have both of these written down. This is how it's organized. We aligned these tools to Bloom's Digital Web Taxonomy so that at the top are the create, then evaluate, then analyze. There's also a navigation on the left where you can choose tools by the type that they are, whether they are blogs or something for authoring content. And when you click on the actual icon within the table, it takes you to a page where there is a link to that website. There's also a description of that tool and a collection of other tools that might be used in that same manner. And then over here on the right, you can see experiences. And teachers use these to write their lesson plans. So they can say, I'm using Animoto to publish my student's video, or I'm using Storyboard Generator to um, animate something, or whatever it might be. So they have that verbiage that they need to create. And all of these are free. There are several hundred of them on this website, so you'll have to take some time to browse. So I'm just going to showcase a few of them. I'm also going to showcase some tools from my apps website, which is all apps for an iPad. And that can be found here. It's aligned the same way. It's aligned to Bloom's Taxonomy. It has the navigation on the left. The difference is these icons take you right to iTunes where you can download that application. But again, they're organized to get students in those higher level thinking skills of Bloom's taxonomy. So we want students up there in the creating, evaluating, and analyzing. But there are times when they are simply applying and understanding and remembering. So on the apps page, there's over 300 apps now for you to use. So let me fly through a few. And you can certainly go back there and browse and communicate with me if you have questions or additions or whatever it might be. The first one is MapSkip. And this is a website that allows you to write a story and place it on a Google map. You can even have a teacher account and student's account to limit that information visibility to others. But it is a great tool it's called MapSkip. You might want to look at something called History Pen. History Pen lets students and teachers upload images. You take a picture of a photograph that you have and build that history collection. And I have a teacher who went through a box of photos that someone found in her grandfather's attic. And she's uploading those photos to share with the world. And how great that is to be able to share a part of your background or your community or your photo collection with History Pen. It is also an app. I have students as young as eight years old who can use Animoto very well. Animoto now has free educator accounts. You get the full-blown application for free. You just apply. You get it free for 180 days. It includes 50 student accounts. And then you just reapply and start over again with another free 180 days. A great, great way to have students creating presentations with images, video, music, and text. 
Maybe you want to try something simple like geo-greeting. Geo-greeting works like this. This is a web tool. You type in your message. So mine was hi world, exclamation mark, happy face. And geo-greeting searches the world for structures that would spell out that message. And by the top of these buildings and the sides of these buildings, they spell out my message and also link to all those with these little hot spots so you can see where the different letters came from in my message. And it gives you a link that you can then send out to others. So it's just a quick and easy, interesting little global spell, uh, spelled message. There are others. There are apps like Stuck on the World and World Explorer. Stuck, or Stuck on Earth actually has photographer's images that you can navigate around the world just to see what some of those places look like with photographs done by professionals. World Explorer is actually a travel app for adults, which I think is great for students because don't they need to know what places and museums and monuments might be existing in the global connection communities that they're connecting with? Why not use that in that way? You could also use Globe for iPad, OK? And I don't think anybody in our district still has those uh, plastic globes that's been around. I, I, have, I don't know where all those went to. But this application actually works just like that. You can spin it around. And when you tap on a location on this app, it takes you to Wikipedia where you can see the country's information and flag and population and so on. OK, Google Earth, of course, we've looked at that before. If you, you are making connections around the world, use Google Earth, an app or web tool, to actually have those students be able to see the, the imagery of that location. There's also something called World Languages Map. And this is a group from the Children's University of Manchester. And their goal is to actually have, across the map, a link to be able to hear the language in every location. And so when you click on their their map, there are locations where you can hear the language. And that, that's a building resource. If we're going to talk about languages, there are tons of applications and web tools for learning languages. You can use Duolingo. You can go to the BBC on the web and learn all of their language languages. If you're using apps, there are lots of apps for language learning as well. OK, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a little quickly here. I encourage students to use Vokey or avatars of some kind to make presentations. And the reason for this is we have students who don't want to speak in front of the class or, again, just like with the comic strips, they'll talk on and on but never really get concise with the information. When they use an avatar, tool. They have to synthesize. They have to compress that into the most important parts. So I have to tell you about the science teacher I was working with. She wanted students to explore the health um, implications of a natural disaster. So she had them um, imagine they were, as a, as a part of a tsunami, they were either the victim or the reporter or the doctor or the government official. And as a part of their role, they had to determine what were the health issues that were impacted by this tsunami. And so the students used an avatar. So the great thing about Vokey is you can record from a computer. You can record from a telephone. You can actually type the text so you don't have to talk at all. And you can add language accents so that my avatar actually speaks with a British accent. And so it really made an effective presentation. What they then did was they went to the app for the CDC to look at how they can learn how to stop the outbreak of diseases around the world. This might be an interesting thing right now. In the United States, we have a lot going on with an epidemic of measles caused by folks in the country who no longer believe in getting immunized. So you know, these are great things that you can do with these tools and smash these applications together. If you're on an iPad, you could certainly use Telegami, which lets you do the same thing. You design your avatar and have it speak whatever content you want. I like ThingLink a lot. It lets you upload your own photo and add hotspots, which can link to 
documents or images or additional information or videos. And so it's a great way for you to share from your community, hey, this is what we are all about, and here's some additional information. And so again, because you can post those on the web or share a link, when you're making your global connections, that's a great way to share. And you're not sharing students' personal images or personal information. Why do we do this? Well, what do we know about students? They only go on the internet once a day for about 24 hours, kind of like myself. So let's just get a few more. If you wanted to create an infographic, you could use a web tool or an app called Canva. This took me a couple minutes. Canva lets you drag and drop your images. So if I wanted to tell you about where I'm from, here's my flag, here's where North Carolina is located, here's the mountain region to the west of me, here's where I live in the Piedmont, and here's the coastal region where I want to live, which is east of me. Voila, there's a nice infographic poster or slide or photo collage about my community that I can then share. It can be saved as an image or a document, and it can be shared with a link or an email. There are lots of apps that get students involved in other cultures. There's a whole selection of apps around the Mayan culture, Mayan Mysteries, Mayan Numbers, Lewd Pursuit, and so on. All of these are free and let students, while they're doing math or language skills or solving puzzles, they are actually learning about another culture. There's the International Children's Digital Library, which has free children's books on the web and on an iPad. What I like about this is you could be simultaneously reading with students from another culture because the books have uh, are being done in dozens of languages. So even if the group you're communicating with doesn't speak the same language as you, you could be discussing or reading that book simultaneously. I encourage teachers to use digital bookmarking sites to make a scoop or make a bag in Scoop It or Bag the Web, which has all of the links to the resources that you want your students to use. So why not have students use that as well? Why not have students collaborate around the world and let's make a scoop or a bag of all the resources about this particular topic or project that we're working on? There are lots of tools like that. Uh, my friend told me there was life outside the internet and I should check it out and I asked him to send me a link. I would rather have a link online than a sticky note because I'm going to lose that sticky note and so do students. So I try and encourage students and teachers to use tools. Why not use Pinterest to create a board for your classroom to post content? Why not explore Live Binders? If you've not used that, Live Binders are digital binders with tabs and content can be PowerPoints and documents and images and links. But if you join line bi Live Binders, which is free, you can browse other people's binders. And you know how we teachers are? We just share everything. So you can find a binder for your curriculum area or your topic and actually curate all the resources that they've already done the work. You just get the content. We want students publishing what they're doing, and all of these are great ways to do that. You could use something like Symbaloo. For those of us who are very visual, your bookmarks are tiles on the Symbaloo. You get tabs that you can create based on subject. If you join Symbaloo EDU, they actually populate some tabs for you with history sites and language arts sites and news sites. And then you can add your own. Again, that's a collaborative tool. It can be shared. It can have multiple users working on those tiles at the same time. Why? Because technology is here to stay. And the world is too small for walls. So I know that's a lot of information, but I try and tell teachers, look, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know what tools you have. I don't know your level of comfort. But here's what I know. You can break this down. What can you do in the next five days? Can you pick one tool to explore, one website, one organization? What could you do then in the next five weeks? What could you do with what you've learned in the next five months? So if you break it down into little bits, Realize there are tons of sites and apps out there, but you have to just break it down and pick what works for you. Some things you're going to discard and say that didn't work, and I've done that as well. But not to look at it as an overwhelming task and then not do it, but to break it down into that 555 plan. Okay. So you can get to all of that from this website, which links to those other two and six or seven other sites that I have. 
You can see my contact information. Would love to hear from anyone who's interested in collaborating globally. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, I thank you all uh, for participating and um, appreciate the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That was fantastic. I think you and I could become great friends. And I'm great. sure that ben, ben is there with you because I know that Ben is very passionate about lots of things that he does and he has lots of great collections of, of useful tools and connect, ways of connecting. Um, and like you, I have Symbaloos and Pinterest and Scoopits everywhere to help me gather together all of my ideas and different things like that. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. I can't wait to spend some time on your website browsing around and seeing what new things I can find. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Lovely. I'll just end the recording.